different stages. Like, four years into our career, we just became astonishingly huge in America for no apparent reason, you know. We put an album out that didn't sell anywhere else in the world, except America and Canada, where it just went mad. And the only album that sold more copies than ours is Thriller by Michael Jackson. Um, but nothing happened here, nothing happened in Britain, nothing happened in Germany or France or Spain or, you know, South America or anything. Then in 1987, 1988, it started breaking over here. So it, it's happened to us over periods of time. You know, it definitely wasn't an overnight success, but it was quicker in America than it was in Europe. So, it, it, of course, it was staggered. It, you do get an opportunity to kind of soak it all in a little bit more. I think it was in 79, you played your first gig at a school. Mm -hmm. uh, did you have any idea of what this would develop to? Not really. I think we all had aspirations that it would it would happen. You do, you dream when you're 17, 18 years old, you think, well, I'd love to be a rock star. Next minute you are one, supposedly, and then you realize what the hell is a rock star anyway, you know, there's always room to go higher. Um, there's a lot of room for improvement in everything that you do. Um, but, uh, <laughs> If somebody had asked me back then, do you honestly think you're going to make it, I would have said yes. But knowing what I know now, I would have probably said, well, I don't know, maybe. I had casualties along the way. Rick lost his arm, Steve died. But in reality, the band kept Steve alive for a long time. It gave him a sense of purpose. I mean, he was an alcoholic the day he joined the band. Um, he would have died a long time ago had he not been for the band. So I, I don't feel any, any kind of... Uh, guilt that, that the band pushed him over the edge or anything like that but yeah it's been worth it for me because i'm a much better person than i would have been and i'm a much happier person than the guy that would have been starting his 19th year working in a factory the actual sales of, of our records is is nice it's, it's it is nice to occasionally be told you've sold 36 million albums worldwide but it's never been a motivation for us i mean it's nice we always want to sell as many as we can but it's not the reason that we do it the reason we do it is because we wanted to get out of that factory life from a, you know, a kind of very industrial town in, in South Yorkshire, north of England, cold, miserable place, and just do something that we were in charge of our own destiny, basically. Um, and making the music is, is, the, is the nicest thing about the whole thing. It's, um, it's a gathering together of a lot of archive material. Some of it's been released before, some of it hasn't. Um, none of it has ever featured on a Def Leppard album before. So we just thought it'd be a good opportunity to take all those songs and put them together on one album. It kind of tidies up that era of the band that featured Steve and gives us an opportunity to clear out the closet. So when we start working on the new album with Vivian, all the old material's gone and we start totally from scratch. Yeah. During the selections of the numbers on the record, you must have been re-experienced a lot of emotions. Yeah, some of us. The, I think the thing that would probably sparked off the most emotion was listening to the tracks that Steve played on, um, knowing that he'd been dead for a, you know a year or two. Um, you know, we'd put the multi-tracks on, and you could solo certain specific tracks, like his guitar. And just before he started to play a solo, you could hear him actually go smoking a Marlboro, you know, and uh, that was that was a bit strange. I mean, it's funny, you know, we didn't get all depressed or anything. It's like, well, listen to that, you know. Shame we couldn't feature it on the record. You can't hear that when all the music comes in. The only reason we do quiet numbers is like everybody else. If we just written six noisy ones, our ears need a break too, you know. And it's like it's just a it's just a it's just the way you go. It's like if if you're running around all day, sooner or later you're going to want to sit down. And it's the same thing with music. If you're, if you're doing rockers, 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 all of a sudden you think, we should do a slow one. For me personally, the most fun I've had making an album is a retroactive album. The most fun I've had is the Adrenalized Tour. So for me, 1992, 1993 have been the best, best years of the band. Really have. I enjoyed those more than any other, any other year that we've, we've done it. I enjoyed the success of Hysteria, it was good, but I was, I was struggling a lot on the Hysteria tour. I had a lot of voice problems, which I didn't really have that many on this tour. I was much more well prepared for it. I was more mentally psyched, much more relaxed, and I had a lot more fun on stage and off stage. And I think that's just the case of just, it's a growing thing. You know, I just felt more comfortable being Joe Elliott in 1992 than I did in 1988. But um, we've maintained a, a level of success that keeps us happy. 
um, and, and everybody associated with the band relatively happy as well, you know. Um, and I mean, but it's not a motivating factor. You know, I mean, the confidence comes, you know, and the confidence goes and then it comes back again. At the moment, we're very confident, you know, we're getting together, we're writing new material, it sounds great. We're going to go in the studio in April and start recording and see where it goes from there. Thank you.